relationships with one another so that we can grow deeper in the Lord with one another. We can build the kind of relationships that will lead into discipleship relationships. But even Sunday school uh, or small groups or whatever you're doing is insufficient for the task of discipleship. And we'll talk about why in a moment. We're simply wanting those groups to identify relationships that we can go deeper with. And we get into D groups or discipleship groups. These groups can be one-on-one. -on -one. You don't have to wait until you have a group of four. You can just be you and one other person. You say, that's pretty intimidating. It doesn't have to be. In fact, one-on-one -on -one is the most effective form of discipleship there is. So don't feel bad if you have a one-on-one -on -one group or a one-on-two group. We want smaller. We don't want bigger. We'll talk a little bit more about that and why, but we want smaller, one-on-one, one-on-two, one-on-three -on -one, -on type of groups where we can build a, a unique level of intimacy together. So that's, that's the funnel. The tip of the spear, the, the tip of this funnel that we're trying to get everybody to is D groups. Ideally, in a perfect world, everybody in the church is part of church, a smaller group, and a, and a D group of some kind so that we ourselves are being discipled and you say well I've already been through discipleship well, discipleship by the way is never over but you know but what about taking others through discipleship that we now God has given information for us and we are to pass it on disseminate that to other people so one question that we've got to kind of answer briefly before we get started is why don't we just stop our funnel there at groups I mean that's what we've always done Sunday school and that's what most churches do and we assume often that discipleship is taking place. This, by the way, is the number one reason why churches don't disciple people. It's because we think we're already doing it. We think that because we have Sunday school, we think that because we have a program, we think that because we have uh, a small group or a home group or a life group or whatever you want to call it, because we have groups, therefore discipleship is happening. But can I tell you, I've been a part of home groups, I've been a part of Sunday school, I've been a part of life groups, I've been a part of all these things in multiple churches in multiple countries. And can I tell you, I've never yet been in a church that used that program to effectively disciple their people. And there's several reasons why D groups are very different from Sunday school and why it's hard to get to the ultimate level of discipleship we need to within a typical Sunday school fashion. Now, hear me when I say this. I'm not disrespecting Sunday school or home groups. It has a place. See, it's right there in the middle of the funnel. It's important. But it's not going to finish the task of discipleship if we stop there at that point of the funnel. We've got to have a deeper and more intimate group to be able to get to that point. I mean, the example I like to use is James 5.16. It says, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you might be healed. I mean, Rick, do you want, do you want to confess your sins tonight? We're going to go around. We're going to start with Rick, and Rick's going to tell us the darkest secret of his life and all of his sins. We're just going to bring the mic around. We're just going to pass it around in this group tonight and just share about our deepest, darkest struggles and sins. Maybe talk about our marriage and the weaknesses of it. Rick, go ahead. <laughs> okay, you, you better not. We're not going to do that here, are we? We can't do that. Well, I say, okay, Rick, this is too big a group. Let's just get into groups of 10 or 15, and let's do that there. Are you going to do that there? Rick's not going to do that there. Mark's not going to do it either. I wouldn't either. We need to get into smaller, more intimate groups, but God has an intention that believers build such intimate relationships with certain other believers, not every believer, but certain other believers that we can get to the place where there is such a familiarity, such an intimacy, such a knowledge of one another, such a trust that I can confess to you the things that I need help with, struggle with. You can come alongside of me, like Galatians 6, 1 says, you know, if you see a brother overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness and fear. We're not just going to do that in Sunday school or in, in, sure not doing it in big church. We got to get down into smaller groups, intimate groups, where we can build that kind of a trust relationship. And let me tell you, I've been churches all over the world. I've seen churches that only do church. I've seen churches that do church and groups but it's not until we get to the place where they get to the bottom of the funnel, D groups, where they do discipleship. That's where the action happens. That's where I've seen true life transformation take place is when we can get into that very focused kind of a group. And that's why we're making such a big deal about it. It's hard to accomplish discipleship just within a, in a group setting or just church in general, partly because a lot of times in a church, and I'm talking about every other church, not this church, of course, but you know, a lot of times it's because our leaders are poorly trained. Not trying to be critical, it's just what I've observed. Leaders typically are poorly trained. 
They don't know what it is to, be, to teach. They don't know what it is they're trying to teach toward or to build toward. They don't know how to uh, start their classes on time, how to encourage people toward uh, being there at the right times. They allow the students often to hijack the conversation. So you meant there, you know, Fred started the morning. He was going to teach about the tabernacle. But, you know, oh, Kevin here, he just wants to talk about Andy Griffith and what he saw on the news. And Kevin totally derails Fred's wonderful tabernacle you know, lesson. And, and then we don't go anywhere with it. Because we're just, we're, we don't know how to keep people focused and, and on task. And so a lot of times it becomes a difficult environment to get to Sunday school. Or we have, better yet, we have trainings available. Teachers just don't come. By the way, that's a pitch for Brad here. Brad, you're welcome. Uh, Brad is having a Sunday school teacher training. I forget the exact date, shame on me, but it's there. Find it. Seek Brad out. It's coming up soon. Also, the reason it's hard to do discipleship in a Sunday school setting <clears throat> is because time, the allotted time, is too short. Have you ever tried to, you know, you, you ever get frustrated with Sunday school? It drove me crazy. I've taught Sunday school all my life. It always drives me crazy, and I'll tell you why. Because you get there, and people show up late. I mean, that's part of the problem. You know, if you're going to do a small group or a Sunday school or whatever, show up not just on time. Show up early to fellowship. And then when the teacher starts, let's get started. But a lot of times it's, it's late, so we take prayer requests and we chit-chat and talk because everybody's not here. And we don't want to start until everyone's here, right? Yeah, you do. Start. You know, and people will learn, hey, you got to show up on time. And you, you, you wait, and then you, you quit, try to get to your lesson. You try to get around some of these rabbit trails people took you on. And then pretty soon, by the time you get to your lesson, you look at your watch, ah! I've only got 20 minutes left and the bell's going to ring and we got to get out. And because you're so hurried now, now you don't have time to sit here and go, Dana, what do you think about this question? And so you stop engaging people in your class. Now you're just throwing information. Hey, Mark, here's everything I, I found last week in my studies. Take it quick because we got to go to church. And we, you may have instructed, you may have educated, but we have not discipled because there's no interaction. And so we assume discipleship is taking place, but we don't have the proper vehicle to actually accomplish what discipleship truly is. The other reason that Sunday school doesn't work out is there's just simply no accountability. I'll also put in there participation. In Sunday school, a lot of times, what's one of the things, I know Sunday school teachers, it's hard. It's hard to get people to engage. You know, so you ask a general question. You know, so what's Jesus talking about here when he said this? Crickets, 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 and nobody, nobody responds. And then eventually they realize, you know, if we just keep our mouth shut, the teacher's just going to say the answer anyway, and we're just going to move on. And so there's no engagement. And even if somebody does answer the question, I don't know that all the other students understand it. So there's no accountability there. I don't know how you're living your life. So, you know, maybe I know that Mary Faye knows the right answer, but I don't know how Mary, how Mary Faye's doing in her marriage. I don't know how Mary Faye's doing on the job. I don't know how, uh, you know, somebody's doing with their, their, you know, physical health. I don't know how they're doing. Because right now there's just, it's pretty one-sided. I'm giving you information, and I hope you get it. But discipleship is so much more than that. We need more participation. We need more accountability. And frankly, it, once you start getting in groups above one, you know, four people, your, your participation and your accountability drops off dramatically and pretty soon it becomes one or two people who give all the answers and do all the interaction and everybody else just kind of sits in the background and now they're no longer receiving all the benefits of discipleship and so we can't do this same thing with any traditional home group bible study um, you know uh, sunday school type of format if we're really going to get serious about discipleship we're going to have to get into even smaller groups and i'm not saying these groups have to run all the time we have them in modules. So you come in and you do an intensive discipleship book, and then you might take a little bit of a break, right? And then we come in as we have time, and then we jump in and we go intensively into another discipleship module, right? And then maybe you take a break. So it's something that we add in, but it's intensive pushes of growth. I am intending to grow in the Lord, and, and we do that through this. Uh, one of the other reasons I have here is that groups are simply, they're just, they're just too large. Like we said before, we're not going to get intimate with a big group. I can't know all of you like I know a small group, you know, within my, my, my D group. And I think another reason is, and it's not really up there, but it's just I don't think churches really know what true discipleship is. 
When you say discipleship, there's not a church in the land that I've ever been to around the world. I say, hey, do you do discipleship? Oh, yeah, we do discipleship. It's like every church knows discipleship is important, but very few could actually pass the test and give you a good answer as to what discipleship is. I mean, think about it. If I were to ask you, what is discipleship, what would be your answer? Could you give me an answer for that? You see, a lot of us have different understandings of what discipleship is. And if the church doesn't know what discipleship is, what it is that we're producing, it's then we're not ever going to make anything of value. When I was a little kid, I probably told you this before, my dad was a carpenter. He had all kinds of tools. I mean, his, his workshop, he had three full barns. Uh, were just full of all kinds of tools and nails and screws and hammers and old pieces of scrap lumber from the jobs. And as a little kid, I remember going out there and I would just pick up these hammers and nails and I'd see pieces of wood and I'd be like, I'll make something. So I just get out there and I just start banging away and like, oh, here's another board. And I just take it and I bang it on there. I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. You know, I'll bang it on there. And pretty soon I just have this pile of wood that's all nailed together. And I remember my brother Clint, he comes by down. He's like, what are you making? I'm like, I don't know. You know, because I had no plan. I just wanted to be active and busy making something. I was like, well, I mean, it kind of looks like a train wreck, but let's see if it floats. And so we take it down to the pond. We drop it into the pond. I mean, straight to the bottom. We just kind of look at that. And to my knowledge to this day, it's still at the bottom of the pond. But why does this have to do with discipleship? I had no plan for building what I was building. I felt productive because I was active. But hear me say this, activity is not productivity. Is it possible for a church to be highly active and busy and wearing their people out and still not accomplishing the purposes God created it to do? Churches do it all the time. We wear our people out, but we assume that activity is productivity. And really, all we're doing is we're little Heath with a hammer and nails going, what are you making? I have no idea, but I'm working really hard at it. And we step back when it's all said and done, and we're like, no idea what it is. We throw it in the pond, and it doesn't float. It doesn't do anything productive, but I sure worked hard at it. I used resources and time and energy, and, and there it is. And that's, I think, a lot of reasons churches don't disciple, because they don't know truly what discipleship is and what it's meant to accomplish. And that's the purpose of this first training, is to give a big picture. What does God say discipleship is? What are the components of discipleship? What are we trying to produce? So if you will, turn to Matthew 28, 19, and 20. If you've been a Christian for any length of time, you'll recognize this is a very familiar passage we call the Great Commission. You're like, oh, hello. I've heard so many sermons on the Great Commission. Let me just say, the Great Commission, a lot of times we've, we, we really don't understand what the command is. A lot of times you hear the Great Commission, the real emphasis is on go, you know. The real emphasis is on uh, go out there and share the gospel. Go out there in all the world and share the gospel. We need people that need to get saved, and it's true. But is that the primary command of the Great Commission? I don't know. Let's read it together. Uh, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Now, let's look at that real quick. What is the primary command? Hint, it's two words. What is the primary command there? Make disciples. You say, yeah, but it talks about teaching and baptizing, and that's all part of the the same basic command. In the Greek, the primary verb that we are going for is make disciples. Is that make converts? Simply. No, it's not. That's step one. I mean, if people aren't getting saved, we got no one to disciple. So obviously that's a part of it. But we don't leave them there any more than a a mother, you know, she births this brand new physical baby and then she just kind of leaves it at home and says, well, I did my part, carried you for nine months, you know, dealt with your kicking all the time in my stomach, You're on your own. Let's see if you can do it. That baby's not going to do well. Baby's probably going to die. But we do that with baby Christians all the time. They're, they're, if you will, born into this world, and we just kind of go, well, I'll bring you to church. So we take them home, and we dump the baby off at church and say, well, be warmed and filled. Uh, Hope everything turns out all right. Uh, See you at the next potluck, you know. And, And to us, we've discipled that person. We brought them to church. Now it's the pastor's job or somebody else's job to take care of that newborn baby. Well, here, this, the primary verb here, in English, it says make disciples. In the Greek, it's a single word. Mathetuo, mathetes, is a disciple. So we are literally to 
disciple, make disciples of all nations. Turn people from other nations who used to hate God into people that love God, who look like God, who do what God does, who knows the knowledge of God. That's what it means to make a disciple, not just get them saved, not just try to barely squeak them in past the sin detectors of heaven and, and get them in. We're here to produce a certain type of individual. A church's goal, I, I hate to use this term in such a crass way, but if the church is a factory, our product is a disciple. People come in as an unconverted person. They come into the church or, you know, or they, they are converted and brought into the church, but as they go out of the church, what we produce is a being who the Bible describes as a disciple. Part of the reason we don't disciple people is because we don't know what a disciple even is. If we don't know what we're producing, we can't make it. If we don't know what the blueprint of a disciple is, we can't make it. We have false views of discipleship. So let's talk about what discipleship is not. A discipleship is not simply getting people to come to church. Okay? It's, it's not just, well, I got them to church and we're done. It's not getting them even just to get into Sunday school. It's not just about getting them active. Whew, they're doing stuff. They're helping with Awanas. Thank God we got another nursery worker. They're a disciple. Maybe, maybe not. It's not just educating them. It's not just making them really smart so that we create these knowledge sponges, you know, where they, there's kind of these spiritual eggheads, you know, they push up the glasses on their nose and go, well, actually, Ezekiel 37 is talking about uh, national Israel, not spiritual Israel. God is bringing back in the Valley of Dry Bones. And we're not here just to create knowledgeable people. There's more to discipleship than that. So it's more than just education. It's not just large group trainings. Hey, we're just going to tell you how to do ministry. And it's not just a system. Once you go through these few lessons, boom, you're a disciple. And you know, that's really common, not just in churches. Can I tell you, we dealt with that on the mission field. We had missionaries all the time who thought that discipleship was a six-lesson series. And once you take these six lessons, Mary Beth, you're done. Woo, disciple. Okay, now Rick, pastor a church. We did that on the mission field. We'd give people, not me, <laughs> people did it though they'd give people six basic lessons that i would give a new believer and they're like well rick you've been here longer than anybody else brother why don't you just be the pastor of this new group and boo, we started started a church the problem is the pastor is still undiscipled and so it's not just a one size fits all that once you rush through it the process of discipleship is over my growth is over my responsibility to god and others is over that's not discipleship it's not just a quick easy simple program. Now, I'm not saying all programs are bad. Programs can provide something that make discipleship accessible to all people. It gives you something that's reproducible so that you can take what you've learned and easily pass it on to others. Because let's face it, we're not all teachers. We're not all people gifted in the ability to disciple others. And so systems are not evil. We just need to understand its limitations. Discipleship goes so much more than just a, a, a quick, easy, fast rapid reproduction system. Disciples have to be handcrafted. You don't take disciples and you rush them through a system and say, woohoo, disciple, next, disciple. And we just start stamping assembly line. That's not a disciple. Disciples are painfully, slowly hand-carved. I mean, Ephesians 2.10, when God calls us his workmanship, the Greek word poema, meaning masterpiece, it's talking about something that is handcrafted, something that God puts meticulous detail into. That's discipleship. It's long, it's painful, sometimes it's messy, and it can last a lifetime. Maybe you're not doing the same level of discipleship with somebody early, later on that you did early on, but you know Paul was still connecting to Timothy right up to the point of his death, admonishing and encouraging Timothy. I mean, you read 2 Timothy. Paul is on his way out. Timothy has already been a pastor for a long time. Timothy has already been in his ministry discipling other people, and guess what? Paul is still feeding into him discipleship, if you will, in some ways is a lifelong relationship that we build with people. It's not fast, but it's effective. I mean, if you think about it, that's what, that's what Jesus did. You know, he preached to the masses. He trained the 70. He had the 12. Did he go smaller than the 12 for discipleship? He sure did. He had the inner three, Peter, James, and John. Did he ever go smaller than that? Sure. He spent individual time with his disciples. John, you know, think about John 21, Jesus just walking along the beach with Peter, discipling him, encouraging him, training him. 
And so Jesus understood what discipleship meant. It meant we go from big and we funneled it. Crowds, 70, 12, 3, 1. Jesus had a funnel. And so we should too. Something I just want to point out to you as we're studying the Great Commission. To whom is the Great Commission given? Now be careful. A lot of times we want to say the Great Commission is given to the church. Is it? When did the church start? Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, he was talking to Peter. He says, upon this rock, I will, future tense, build my church. So the church didn't exist in Jesus' day. By the time we get to Pentecost, Jesus promises the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes, and now you have this body that's gathering. And now in Acts 2, we see that people were added to the church. So at that point, now we have the church. The problem is, the Great Commission predates the church. So who is the command to, the command to make disciples given to? The command to make disciples is given to disciples. Now, that involves the church because we're all part of the church. But the command to make disciples is not just given to the church as a whole. Whoo! Have fun with that, Pastor Heath, and Unity Baptist Church at large, but I'm going to kind of step back from that disciple-making thing. That's not really my deal. Disciple making is the privilege of all people. It's the highest calling that a person can have. It's the highest influence that a person can have in another person's life. Shaping them. Like Timothy. I mean, sometimes we think, oh, it is so it's just I'm, I'm meeting with one other person or two other people. What an impact that can have. Think about the kind of impact Timothy had, and yet who did Paul credit him for his discipleship? His grandmother and his mother. You never know the person that you're discipling, what God is going to do with them. It's the, it's the highest honor and privilege that a person can have in their life. And it's a command that's given to us as Jesus' disciples. You'll also find this command in 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 2. <clears throat> this is a verse that you'll often see taught with discipleship, but a lot of times we skip the first verse. I'll just read it for you here. So he says, You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. There is the process of discipleship right there. That's what that is. He says, uh, but now before we can get to the, the process, you know, which you see what it is, he says the things that you've learned from me pass on to faithful men, okay, people you can trust, people when they say they're going to be there, they're going to be there, so that those people can then do what? Teach others also. There's supposed to be a chain we are not mature disciples until we're disciple makers. Is that clear from this passage? We're not full mature disciples until we're disciple makers. Until we're passing on what God has given to us to somebody else, we have not fully matured in our discipleship. Because the intention here is that the things that we've learned are not just for us. It's so that it can bless our life, transform us, and now we can give it to them. But it can't stop with them either. Where does it got to go? They have to teach someone else. This is why, by the way, we continue to disciple people even as they're discipling others so that we can ensure that the people from their generation of discipleship are still discipling the people that come after them. That way we can see that discipleship is a self-propagating system. We don't just stop and go, well, I trained you. I did my part. You do your thing. We continue to disciple them until they're discipling someone else because they're not a full, mature disciple until they're training someone else. Now, part of the reason we don't disciple others is because we ourselves maybe haven't been strengthened. As he said, the first verse, he says, you then, my child, so that you can accomplish this purpose of discipleship, you be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. We can't teach somebody else what we don't have. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Have you ever tried to teach someone to juggle, but you've never tried juggling before yourself? You ever try that? It doesn't work very well. You've got to know how to juggle before you can teach people to juggle. You have to know what it means and to live out a faithful discipleship kind of life before we can disciple other people. At first, so what he does is he commands him. He says, first, you allow yourself to be strengthened. To be strengthened it has this idea that you're, you're, you're buttressed together, you're supported. It's, th it's kind of like a bridge. You guys remember in junior high, did you ever have to make a balsa wood bridge? Teacher gives you a little plank of balsa wood. You know balsa wood. It's this lightweight stuff. You make like little rubber band paper airplane, airplanes out of it and 
It's called the weed tree for a reason. It grows up in Central and South America. And in one year, a balsa tree can grow up 12 feet. But because it grows so fast, it's really flimsy. It's really weak. It has to be strengthened. It's not like a piece of oak. And so your teacher gives you this little plank of balsa wood and says, make a bridge out of it, and your grade's going to depend on how much it can hold. Now, some of the boys thought they were cute, and they'd just bring it back, and they'd write the word bridge on it. You know, this is my bridge. It's just a piece of balsa wood. You put some weight on it. What's that, what's that guy going to do? Just, it's just going to snap because it's simple. It's simple. It's just by itself without any kind of strengthening. What do you have to do with balsa wood to make it hold weight? You've got to make it complex. You've got to have the skill of an army engineer. And you go through with an X-Acto knife, and you're cutting it into little planks, and you're, you're supporting and strengthening it in areas so that it can hold weight. So when the teacher starts putting all those little fishing weights at the bottom of it, it doesn't just snap in half right away. It has to be made complex. In a lot of ways, the Bible's telling us that you start out in life simple. You read through Proverbs 7, he talks about a guy who is foolish. He's described as being simple. He's unable to withstand temptation. He just falls headlong into it. He's simple. He's, we've got to make our mind more complex, more uh, strengthened in Christ. And so we have, to, we have to have our minds, as Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, we have to be renewed in our mind so that our mind thinks like God does, so that I can apply the right verse to the right situation, and now I'm strengthened. I can withstand against these temptations of the devil. And so we ourselves have to allow ourselves to be strengthened before we can pass that on to somebody else. Now, the Great Commission, there's a few things we need to see about it. There's the proclamation of the Great Commission. What's, he, what's the proclamation? It's go, and it's baptized, and it speaks to the task that we have. Go implies that you can't stay. I mean, that's simple, right? Go implies that you're not yet where you're supposed to be. Go means you've got to be intentional. You've got to have an idea, a goal in mind. I'm going somewhere. I don't, for me personally, I don't just hop in my car and start driving saying, I wonder where this is going to lead me. Maybe you do that. But when I get in my car, I, I do my car driving like I do my shopping. I know what I want. I go in, I buy it, I leave. My wife does it a little differently. There's no criticism there. But, I, you know, I have a very intentional idea, and I go, and I get it, and I get it done, and I come back. I, I'm intentional. Going means there's intentionality. Have you discovered that discipleship doesn't happen unless you intend for it to happen? It's not an accidental byproduct of just being a Christian and being around other Christians. We have to think about what discipleship is, and we've got to earnestly pursue it by going and baptizing this has the idea of uh, we're looking for a certain kind of person. It's a committed person. Let me say this dogmatically. I think I can do this with the confidence of all Scripture. If you're not a baptized Christian, you're not a committed, serious Christian. Can I tell you, back in the late 90s when I was preaching crusades in India, in India the church is even stronger. They would declare you unsaved until you got baptized. Not that the baptism saved you, but they didn't believe your simple words of testimony. I believe in Jesus, mainly because they would say, I believe in Jesus. Oh yeah, and Vishnu, and Shiva, and you know, all these other gods that they have. So they wouldn't even believe that you're a Christian until you're baptized because you weren't committed. You weren't willing to put on the jersey. I mean, can you imagine joining the Ashland football team, but you won't wear the jersey? I'm on the team, coach. I want to play. I'm here to play, coach. Here, wear this jersey. I don't think so. I don't want to be associated with Ashland. I think I'm going to wear the Russell ball team jersey. What's going to happen to you? You're going to get kicked off the team. Why won't you identify? You're not serious about Ashland football unless you're going to wear the jersey. Baptism is the jersey of our team. And if you're not going to wear the jersey, you're not a serious and committed Christian. And frankly, if you refuse baptism, there's every reason in the world to doubt whether or not your claim of authentic, authentic faith is really true. Why would you deny baptism? Now, I'm not saying you have to be baptized here, but you do need to be baptized scripturally. You know, you need to be immersion. It's what baptizo means. It means to dump, to dunk, to plunge, to immerse into. You know, you've been baptized scripturally, come on into this church. But that's what we do. We identify with a team. And somebody who's not baptized is not committed enough, ready to receive Discipleship. Why? Because in 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 2, what, what kind of people did he say we're looking for? Look for what kind of men who will be able to teach others also? Faithful. Have you ever tried to teach someone who, or, or disciple someone who's not faithful? They're not ready to grow? Oh, you're going to beat your head against a wall because you're just like, wow, I want this so much for you, but you don't see it. You don't see the need for it. 
It's going to drive you crazy. And so you don't look for smart people. You don't look for uh, beautiful people or rich people or certain age, young or old. You look for someone who's faithful. They're the kind of person, when they say they're going to be there, they're going to be there. When, they're, when we learn a memory verse together, they're the kind that they're going to learn it. The kind of person where you say, hey, read this chapter ahead of time. They've got it done. They're faithful. You can count on them. You can trust them. That's what we're looking for. And baptism shows a measure of that commitment. I'm willing to put on the jersey. By the way, if you're in this church, you're listening to this live stream, you realize you have not been scripturally baptized, we encourage you, come seek one of us out. Call the office, let us know. We'll sit down and talk with you, make sure you understand what baptism is. You want to take that first step toward being a committed and faithful Christian, we'll walk you through that. That's what we're here to do. So that's the proclamation. What is the, uh, we're looking then at the person of the Great Commission. It's the word make disciples. Here he's showing us the end goal. The end goal of discipleship, unremarkably, is to make disciples. Now the question is, what does that being look like? What is, it, what is a disciple? What, what kind of creature are we trying to produce here? We're talking about the quality of a person. Now when I say disciple uh, to you, it may conjure up all kinds of different ideas in your head, but can I tell you what it meant to be a disciple in Jesus' day? In Jesus' day, we, we, uh, when somebody wanted to be a disciple, it's because I've lived my life and I identify with somebody's particular point of view. I respect how they live. And, you know, let's say I'm, I'm, I'm living life and I just see Mark Renfro. Man, I just really respect that guy. I like his life. I, I kind of want to learn to live a life like Mark. I want to be like Mark someday. And so I might approach Mark as a mentor and say, hey, can I disciple under you? And if I'm a faithful kind of person that Mark feels like he's willing to invest in me, he will allow me now to follow Mark around. And so I will watch what Mark does. I will listen to Mark's teachings. And I will learn from him, and I will grow in him. But the idea is not simply that I learn the knowledge that Mark has. I'm learning to become Mark. That's what discipleship is. We're not just learning knowledge. We're not just trying to beat people in Bible trivia and get all proud and say, wow, look at all the knowledge I have of the Bible that you don't have yet. Someday you'll be as wise as me. Being a disciple means I want to become Jesus. Not as a God, but I want to become a little Jesus. That's what a Christian means, a little Christ. I want to become a little form of Jesus in my imperfect self. I want to do what Jesus did. I want to love what Jesus loves. I want to think like Jesus thinks. I want to teach what Jesus taught. I want to become a little version of him in as much as my frail, weak body can become. That's what I want to be. That's what we're trying to produce. It's the person. That there's a certain quality of that person. What's the process? That we're teaching them. This speaks to the knowledge that we are imparting to a person. It's the uh, teaching them is the word didasco. It means to uh, discourse, to have a conversation. Now, when we make disciples, he's telling us that we don't make disciples through proclamation. If we wanted to do that, you know, he would have used a different Greek term, kerygma. It's, uh, think of like a town crier in a medieval town. They're ringing a bell or whatever. Hear ye, hear ye, you know, and they're, they're just announcing information from the king. Here's what you need to know. No interaction, no need to talk to me. I'm just the town crier. It's information. Upload it into your brain and leave. That's kerygma. That's preaching. It's important. 2 Timothy 4.2, preach the word. Instant, in season and out of season. But we can't disciple by simply preaching at you. I, I don't know where you live. I don't know how Vessie's doing back there. If I'm just pre I'm telling you right now, I'm preaching, and Vessie's hearing it, and I, and, I, and, I, and I love my brother, but I don't know if he's, I don't know what he's getting out of this. There's no didasco. There's no, there's no discourse. There's no conversation. Conversation, teaching, is how we ensure that people are becoming disciples. And so if we're just talking at people in Sunday school, we're talking at people on Wednesday nights, we're talking at people on Sunday morning and Sunday evening, it's good, it's proclamation, but where's the discourse? Where's the accountability? Where's the, where's the back and forth? Where's the conversation? So uh, instead of just telling Fred the truth, I'll be like, Fred, so in verse 5, when Jesus said this, what do you think he meant by that? You know, and then Fred gets to respond back, and I can be like, oh, that's a great insight, brother. I know now that he understands it, and we can move on. Or Fred might say something heretical and be like, hmm, that's a very interesting thought. Help me understand that. You know, I'm still polite about it, even though the guy gave me heresy. You know, but but we, we, now I know he doesn't understand, and we got to go a little deeper. I rephrase my question. That's how we make disciples, by teaching them. 
a word that means a discourse, a conversation. That's why you'll discover in these books here, and we'll let you look at some. We've got some up here. We've got them in the back of the room. Module number one, if you want to see it, you're going to notice that essentially the book is scripture and questions. Yeah, there is some explanatory material in there, but largely it's scripture and questions. Why is it a scripture and question format? Because we want you to have a conversation. We don't want this just to be a teaching time where Kevin goes home and he does all this great study, has all these great insights, and then he just talks at you the whole time. We want Kevin to be, you know, to, to ask questions. Okay, Jimmy, why don't you read this verse? Ah, uh, Jimmy, what'd you get out of that? It's, it, and then he reads the question. What do you, uh, Jimmy, why don't you answer that for us? And we just wait and listen to what Jimmy has to say. And now we can move on. That's teaching. And Jesus says that's how we make disciples. It's through that conversation. It's not just the proclamation of the word. It's a back and forth. Then we look at the production of the Great Commission. It speaks to their activity, that people are meant to do something, not just absorbing knowledge. You know, if we just absorb a lot of knowledge, what's the warning in 1 Corinthians 8? Knowledge puffs up. Puffs up means that our appearance exceeds our true constitution. We're a, we're a puffer fish. We're a Macy's Day balloon. You know, Macy's Day balloons, they're great. I love watching the Macy's Parade, these giant Snoopies. You know, when we see it, we're like, oh, they're the size of a four-story building. You know, they're huge, and they look amazing and impressive. What's inside Snoopy? Nothing, just air. Snoopy is all puffed up. But you could probably fit him into a suitcase when it's all done. There's not a whole lot to Snoopy. Okay, he's saying that knowledge by itself makes me feel more spiritual than I am, and I feel very big. Behold, look at my Bible knowledge. Be impressed. And if that's all we're driving toward in discipleship, we're going to create proud, arrogant people. We don't want that. I mean, Bible says God resists the proud. We don't want to create proud people in a church. So we can't have discipleship just being knowledge. We can't go there. That's, what, that's how Jesus, he described a Pharisee in Matthew 23, 27. He says, woe to you. By the way, woe is not a good word. You don't want Jesus telling you woe. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, okay? These tombs where they would whitewash them, they'd, they'd make it a clear, so you wouldn't be stepping on, you know, you know, grandma or grandpa or whatever there, and you be respectful and step around it. So it looks beautiful after you've whitewashed it, but what's on the inside, Jesus says. But on the inside, it's dead men's bones. So you can have this tombstone that's just this beautiful, glorious, beautiful thing, but what's on the inside? Decaying and deadness. Jesus says, that's you Pharisees. With all this knowledge that you have, you look beautiful, but there's really nothing there when it gets down to it. So we don't want to be like a Pharisee. What do, how do we respond to that? James 1.22 says, be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. When we're only a hearer, we have knowledge, but we're not a doer of the word, what have we done? We've deceived ourselves. I think I'm spiritual because I've got a lot of Bible knowledge. But we're supposed to be acting on that knowledge, aren't we? There's a body of truth that we're supposed to be living in obedience to. We're to be doers of the word. That this training that we give in teaching, the training that we do in the church, it's meant to cause you to behave a certain way. It's sort of like when my wife was uh, coaching volleyball. If you talk to Amber at any length of time, you'll discover that she loves volleyball. She played volleyball in, I think, junior high. She played volleyball in high school. She, played, she was a captain of the volleyball team in college. She has repped volleyball for leagues. She has coached volleyball in several different Christian academies. And I remember watching her in Kunming International Academy in China, and she'd be, she's taking this ragtag bunch of kids who are accustomed to just showing up and just kind of lackadaisically playing volleyball. <laughs> oh, yeah, you get it, you know. And they're not really putting their heart into it. They're not volleyball disciples. They're just out there just to kind of have a good time. I want to be around. I like the fellowship I get from this place, but don't make me take volleyball too seriously. <laughs> but then they got Amber. And it was funny because Amber's blood and guts. She looks sweet. She's not. She is a drill sergeant. And she's going to drive these kids to be the best volleyball players they can be. And she's pushing them hard. And she's making them run laps. And she's, she's showing them these drills. And they're hitting it hard. She's telling them, don't just hit it over. You're going to bump, set, spike to the glory of God. You're, gonna, you're just going to play your hearts out. And in so doing, you're going to hate me during practice, but you're going to love me during the games because you're going to go out there and you're going to be a success. And when you can do something well, you enjoy it more too, don't you? 
those of you who've ever tried to play piano, I mean, your early stages of playing piano, do you really enjoy? I mean, is that fun? It's easy, isn't it? I can do it. But is that really fun? Do you get a lot of, like, soul enrichment from just rubbing your knuckles down the keyboard? Or is it the hard work of learning how to play, you know, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, or I don't know what it is, Theron would know, you know, but some, some really beautiful piece of, of music that takes time, months sometimes, just to learn, but once you get there, it's soul-satisfying as you feel your fingers doing something, you know, magical on the keyboard, and it's, it's gorgeous, and you're like, I love the piano now. It's not chopsticks or whatever you're playing. I think in a lot of ways, church is that way. People are bored with church. Do you know why they're bored at church? It's not because we don't have good enough music. And it's not because we don't have enough programs. I think people are bored with church because we don't challenge people to get into the white water. We have people in church going, dun 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 Boy, isn't church fun? They're kind of like, not really. We haven't challenged them to be disciples. We haven't given them real truth, something that we haven't showed them how they can really get into the game and work hard to the glory of God and have that rich soul satisfaction that they're doing the most significant work that a human can do, and that is to make a disciple of Jesus Christ. There's nothing more satisfying you can do than to pour yourself into someone and watch them develop into a disciple of Jesus. It's the greatest privilege that a believer can have. And I think believers, they're bored with church because they're not challenged to do the real work of church. We're encouraging you through these D groups to get involved in the white water, to be involved in life transformation. Someone who loves the sport of Christianity as much as our coach does, as much as Jesus. And so... <clears throat> We've got to be careful that we have a discipleship program that teaches others to observe or to obey. Jesus says, all that I've commanded you. How long does that take? That's a, long, that's a lot of information. Discipleship is not fast and easy. If you're looking for a quick system, keep looking, because discipleship takes time. But what did Jesus think of religion that was only about knowledge and external obedience? Is that the end of discipleship? Hello, we've got knowledge. We have obedience. Are we done? Is it possible to have great knowledge of God and not be a disciple? James 2.19 says, Even the demons believe they have certain right doctrines about God. Is a demon a disciple? He has right knowledge. Demons, not, if you were shaking your head, no, that's the proper answer. A demon is not a disciple of Jesus Christ. Well, what about somebody who's knowledgeable and obedient? They're a hearer and a doer. Surely that person is a disciple. Is it possible to have somebody who's highly knowledgeable in the Word of God, highly active in obedience to what they see, and still not be a disciple. We call that a Pharisee. They were the most knowledgeable people out there. I mean, they memorized the first five books of the Bible. We barely can read through Leviticus. They memorized it. They fasted for two days a week. They had 600 laws that they were following. You know, they wouldn't drag their chair in the dirt. They wouldn't climb a tree on the Sabbath. They counted their steps. They tithed of, uh, their spices they covered their glasses with cheesecloth so they didn't accidentally swallow a gnat and become ritual unclean. I mean, that's, that's the level of detail that a, that a Pharisee would go through. But they weren't a disciple of Jesus. In fact, they resented Jesus. They became the greatest enemies of Jesus. Sometimes, highly active, highly knowledgeable people can become the greatest opponents to true, healthy Christianity. Is that possible? Because they want to control what that looks like. That's what the Pharisees did. Jesus was coming in, and he was rocking their world, saying, here's what real religion looks like. And the Pharisees are like, oh, no. It has to be look like what we say it looks like. It has to be our Old Testament traditions and oral laws and the things that we've passed down. And sometimes if all we do is we think that a disciple is someone who is highly knowledgeable and highly obedient, they can become enemies of the cross. We've got to make sure that we're getting to something else. Jesus, what are we missing here? Matthew 23, 23, he says, Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. He says, You tithe and dill and cumin, and you have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. What went wrong? I mean, the Pharisees started out good. To be a Pharisee, it means a separated one. While everybody else is compromising, everybody else is abandoning the word of God, they're holding fast. The problem is they became legalistic, and they started to canonize their application of Scripture rather than just the teaching of the Scripture itself. They were teaching the commentaries, not the Bible. And they became filled with 
pride because of their knowledge and their obedience. Thank you, God, that I am not like this man. And we can become enemies of the cross despite our knowledge, despite our obedience. So, there, Jesus, I want you to see, Jesus didn't actually condemn the Pharisees here. He says, you tithe of anise and mint and come in. And some of these translations will even say these things you ought to have done. Jesus isn't criticizing their strict obedience to the law, trying to obey and honor God. What did he say they were missing? The weightier matters of the law. When the Bible talks about something being weighty, he's talking about something that is important or valuable. Uh, in fact, the word, uh, you know, gloried or to glorify God, you know, talk about uh, weight. God's glory and things that are valuable like that are described as something being heavy, weighty. Okay? Uh, in fact, you can even read in the book of... Uh, 2 Corinthians 4, it says, for this light and momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory. And so heavy things are valuable things, lightweight are empty things. The Bible talks about the wheat and the chaff. You're familiar with a, a winnowing fork? Think, picture a big rake, you know, and they're taking the wheat and they're throwing it up in the air. And then the stalk, the, sh the chaff, the thing, the stalk that, was, that raised up the wheat, it had a purpose, but it, it was empty. It, would bl it was blowing away. That wasn't the most important part. What was important, it was the heavy stuff, the wheat head that would fall to the ground. And you would sift your wheat that way. And so the heavy part was the valuable part. Jesus is saying, what is weighty? What is valuable? He says, what is it that they're missing? Justice, mercy, and faithfulness. So they had knowledge they had obedience. What were they lacking? They were lacking integrity. Their heart hadn't been transformed. They were knowledgeable. They were active, but they were unkind people. And see, and that's where we, a lot of times we drop the ball when it comes to discipleship. We miss the weightier matters of the law. As you can see here, we've been clearly outlining three different components of discipleship that need to be necessary to be there. Knowledge, obedience, and integrity. You'll notice that's K-O-I. That's why we have koi up here uh, for a koi fish. Koi fish are interesting. You know, they originate in Japan. They stand for prosperity, love, and success. Uh, koi fish, they, they come in a variety of colors, red, orange, yellow, black, white, spotted, blue even. There's blue koi. Uh, they can get sunburned just like me. I don't know if you knew that about a koi. Uh, they can, like me, they, they burn and peel. There is no tanned koi out there. They just get burned. Um, and, and koi, another interesting component of them is that they become more valuable with age, just like you. Koi are an interesting fish. Another thing they do is they tend to swim together in and amongst one another. I just love watching koi. You ever do that? And you, you go across a little bridge or something in China. We always had these little koi ponds in these gardens, and you'd come through these, these little gazebo things and these trails, and, and as soon as you come nearby, all these koi would just flock in and amongst each other, and they're hungry, and they're ready to feed, and you just throw a little bit of food in there, and it's just, I mean, the water just agitates because of these hungry koi that are in and amongst each other, and they all want to feed together. I want you to think of our discipleship groups as little koi ponds. We're all little kois. We're very different. Red, you know, red and yellow, black and white, they're precious in his sight. We're all different, but we come together, these weird, disparate people from uh, different ages, different ethnicities, different uh, financial backgrounds and we come together like little koi and we swim close to one another for the purpose of feeding and growing and so these little koi ponds these little d groups that we have why am i making a big deal about koi because i want you to remember koi k-o-i i don't want you to forget the three important components of discipleship we are imparting knowledge but we don't stop there we are seeking and promoting obedience to the knowledge that they have but we don't stop there we're ultimately driving to what Jesus called the weightier matters of the law. And that's personal integrity. It's, it's character of the heart. It's life transformation. It's life change. Because you take out any one of these components, you don't have true discipleship. What happens if I have, uh, we take out knowledge? We get rid of the knowledge component. We just focus on obedient and integrity. We got a cult, don't you? You have Mormons. They don't have a true body of truth. They go outside the Bible to the pearl of great price and other things doctrines and covenants and they, they'll teach you that Jesus was a, was a man like you and me he, he became a god and by the way he's Lucifer's brother and, and, and you can populate your own planet with soul children you're not going to hear that on day one by the way you talk to the Mormons but if you look at them they're highly obedient and they have tremendous integrity they tend to be some of the nicest people that you're going to meet very family oriented good people 
going to hell because they don't have a right body of truth. We have to have knowledge. What happens if we scrub obedience? We just have right knowledge and we're just good, nice people. We just don't do anything. <laughs> you get lazy, unproductive Christians. The church goes nowhere if all we have is knowledgeable, nice people. We've got to be a people that does something. James says, show me your faith. Prove it to me by your works. What happens if we remove the integrity component? We just are very wise people or very knowledgeable people in the Word of God. We're highly active. What does that produce? We already mentioned it to you. It produces a Pharisee. Tons of knowledge, very obedient, no integrity. You're whitewashed tombs. And so we've got to be very careful that in our discipleship, we have koi discipleship. We have all three components. We're driving toward a knowledge of the Word of God so that they can obey the Word of God, so that in the end, these disciplines will produce a character change, a life transformation in the life of a believer. That is biblical discipleship. And if you look all over the Bible, you'll see koi all over the pages of the Scripture where God is prompting us to acquire knowledge, to live it out in obedience, producing a life of integrity. That's the end goal of discipleship, is Christ-likeness, that we look and act like Jesus, we think like Jesus, we're loving people, we're kind people, we're generous people, we show the fruit of the Spirit, we're loving people, we're joyful people, we're people of peace, we're patient with one another, we're kind, we meet one another's needs, we're gentle, we're, we're meek, we're willing to line up submissively under God-given leadership. That's a fruit of the Spirit. And we have self-control. We don't just live according to our physical passions. That's what we're driving toward is the fruit of the Spirit. A transformed and changed life. But that comes through the components of knowledge, components of obedience, producing integrity in the life of the believer. Now, when I first started discipling people, I didn't understand this. I was a young, I was a young man when I entered ministry, and I was a youth pastor. I'm like, I think like 23 years old. <laughs> I'm a minister of youth and music, uh, believe it or not. And uh, I, I just knew in my heart, though, that we needed to do mentorship, discipleship. And I didn't have a lot to offer, but I thought I'd offer to folks what I could. And there's folks who wanted to grow and learn. And I was like, oh, we can, we can meet together. And I remember sitting down. Let me just formally apologize to anybody at Monte Vista Baptist Church from my past who were discipling under me. Uh, all I did is throw knowledge at them. You know, I just, I took all my Bible college notes and I stuck them in the back of a dump truck and I'd beep, beep, and I just, I dumped all kinds of like four years of Bible college training into their lap. You know, and I'm teaching them on pre-trib rapture, you know, and sublapsarianism and all kinds of crazy stuff. And you're like, well, I don't even know what that is. And he didn't either, probably still doesn't. And you know what, it isn't, it, that isn't what was important, but I didn't know what else to give them. And so I just gave them lots of knowledge because that's what people gave me. Now, it didn't produce a whole lot. Now, later on, I understood, wow, there's got to be things that we're building toward. I've got to equip them with certain skills, certain disciplines of, of, of church and Bible study and prayer. And so we have that. But then I got to China, and, and it rocked my world again in discipleship. And I was like, wow, I really got to figure out this discipleship thing. I was teaching a class in, uh, uh, was it Chengdu? I was teaching a class, I think, in Chengdu, China, where we were teaching people on how to disciple church members. And we get to the end of the class, and as we always do, we just open it up, Q&A time. Anything you want to ask off the cuff, we'll give you the best answer we got, but we know you got one shot here. Give it to us. And one of the people after discipling church members, we thought we were going to get classes on how do we, you know, questions on how do we implement this in our life. What are some of the struggles you have with discipleship? No, this lady says... Uh, you know, she was a leader, and one of the leaders in her church, and uh, her wife a leader or whatever. And she's like, uh, well, I got a question for you. Uh, first of all, at my church, we have a women pastor. Um, and this woman pastor is uh, being unfaithful with my husband. And when I confronted her privately on this, uh, she beat me with a rod. I called the police, and they put about it. What do I do? Kevin, would you respond to that, please? <laughs> I mean, really, these are the questions we're having here. And I realized... Wow, we're entirely missing the integrity component here in discipleship. We've got people who are, you know, are knowledgeable in the Word of God. And we've been training them like crazy. And we have people who are active in their ministry. They're sharing the gospel. They're doing church. They're doing all the things that churches do. But they go home and they beat their wife. They cheat people in business and evidently <laughs> cheating with people in the, in the church. 
we've got to drive toward the end goal of discipleship, which is integrity, which is Christ-like behavior. We're not a fully mature disciple just because we know things and we do things. It's not enough just to have a name tag. I'm a deacon. I'm a pastor. I'm a Sunday school teacher. I'm a wanna director. It doesn't matter what your title is. If you're an unkind, unloving, harsh, cruel, mean, inflexible, uh, unsubmissive person, not a disciple. We're driving toward knowledge, which brings obedience, which produces integrity in the life of the believer. This is what we're driving toward. You're going to find it all over the scriptures, but just to, I'll, I'll, I'll speed it up a little bit. I'll go to just to Romans 12, 1 and 2. It's a very famous verse. You'll pro you've probably memorized it at some point in time or another, but he just says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable or spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. As you read through that, can you see the components of koi in there? Knowledge, obedience, integrity, it's all over there. It's all over a lot of different scriptures. I'll just highlight some of you, some of them for you. Where's the knowledge? Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Okay? The mind, with the renewal of your mind, there's no transformation. There's no sanctification. There's no becoming like Christ. It begins in the mind. There has to be a body of truth that we are giving people. And so don't tell me you're discipling somebody, because you know, I've asked people before, do you disciple people? And the person says, oh, yeah, I disciple them. Well, tell me what that looks like. What do you do? Well, I just meet with Jimmy uh, about once a month, and we just go down, and we have a coffee, and I just ask him, you know, hey, how's your marriage? How's your life? How's it going? I said, okay, and? No, I mean, that's all we do. I would say you have begun something that's very good and healthy and is a component of discipleship, but you've not discipled that person. There is a pastoral component of discipleship. How are you doing? How's your marriage? How's your life? But at some point in time, we are to impart a body of truth to them to help them improve in their understanding and their knowledge of God because it's through that knowledge that their mind is renewed. Jesus said in John 8, 32, you will know the truth, and what will that do? To set you free. And so we have to be imparting knowledge to people, or let me just tell you, we're not discipling people. That has to be there, that knowledge component. What are you imparting to that person? Or are you just an accountability partner? That's good too, but you're not discipling. We've got to be imparting something to them through that knowledge. What about obedience? He says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Daily choose to obey God and do what he wants you to do. There's your obedience. Every day, choose to lay down what you want to do and do what God wants you to do. Present your body as a living sacrifice. Daily live for Jesus, doing what you're supposed to do. What about integrity? We're supposed to be holy and acceptable to God, not conformed to this world, transformed. The Greek word for transformed gives us our English word metamorphosis, you know, from caterpillar to a butterfly. Isn't that just an amazing process? I mean, it's really disgusting when you really look at what a caterpillar does. I didn't realize when they go into that cocoon, I guess I just think, you know, like some magic thing happens to them. He transforms. Um, do you know a caterpillar actually releases these different enzymes and he dissolves himself? And he just becomes a pile of goo that kind of, you know, comes together through God's magic, if you will, and he becomes this butterfly. But he constitutionally is no longer that caterpillar with multiple legs and, and chewing on leaves and, and stuck on the ground. Now, this, it's, a, it's an entirely separate being with different desires. You don't see butterflies going out and chewing on leaves. You, you don't see that. If you did, it'd be a terrifying sight. Butterflies are these beautiful things, these long little, you know, straws that God gave them and they go in they drink the nectar of flowers and they fly around they're beautiful and when they die you put them in a little you know, <laughs> little, you know what do you call them a little display box or something you know, they're totally fundamentally different butterflies don't do what caterpillars do transformed Christians don't do what lost people do we're no longer leaf munching people we're people that fly and drink nectar. We're, we have totally different desires. We desire to be in the sky, not, not on the ground. And so there's a transformation of life that takes place here. So knowledge is what we know, right? Obedience is what we do. Integrity is who we are. And all of these things 
need to be within our discipleship. It's what we're driving to. We need all of it. Second Peter 1, 5 through 8, I think describes all these components of coy discipleship best. He says, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue knowledge, and knowledge self-control, and self-control steadfastness, steadfastness with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and increasing, they will keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in our knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now hopefully you can see all the components of koi within that verse. I mean, it's, it's all over the place in several different locations for each one of these components. But just to make it clear to you, he, first thing he says is make every effort. Discipleship is something that we make every effort to do. We use great strength to, uh, to try to bring ourselves to a place of maturity in Christ. Now, understanding, like Galatians 3, Paul says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Who, having begun in the Spirit, are you now going to be made perfect in the flesh? So we know that sanctification is entirely a work of God that we have to give maximum effort to. Does that make sense to you? It doesn't have to. It's just what the Word of God teaches. Sanctification is entirely a work of God that we give maximum effort to. We, uh, he says, we make every effort, which means we give it every opportunity to grow. And then he says we're commanded to supplement our faith. Supplement in the English, I think, is a weak word. The Greek word is a much stronger word. And when I say supplement here, you think centrum, okay? You think uh, multivitamin. You think Flintstones. You think chewable, gummy vitamins. It's something that's good if you take it, but if you don't, mm, oh, well, you're not out much. When he says supplement your faith, the idea is that somebody is putting on a grand performance and they are lavishly giving everything that they have to make it happen. If you watched the, the 2008 Olympics opening ceremony when China hosted the Olympics, and they put this lavish show on, you have a brief idea of what supplement means. Uh, I'm, I'm one more close to home, you've been to the Living Christmas Tree. Supplement is what Theron does for the Living Christmas Tree. Okay? He doesn't just half job this thing. He puts his whole heart into it for months and months at a time. He doesn't have a couple of trees up here. He has a little forest of lit up trees. Not only that, we got ourselves a tree that goes all the way to the ceiling with 30,000 lights. And then we have live actors and people dressed up and people who have been singing for months to make this happen. And we've got videos and, and they put together these cool little flyers, these little neat little frisbees, you know, that we can hand out to people and we're going out to the park and we're, we are lavishly supplying everything that this program needs to succeed. That is the idea of supplement. You're giving it everything it needs to succeed. God says that's what we do in our Christian life. We give it everything that it needs to succeed. And yet I know a lot of Christians who don't even have themselves a good study Bible. Friends, spend a little bit of money. You know, if you need to go to a, a conference, go to that conference. Spend a little money. You know, we'll spend two, three hundred dollars on a sound bar for our TV just so we hear, you know, that movie a little bit more clear. But we but we would we would gasp at the idea of buying a genuine leather study Bible for a hundred bucks. Oh, it's something you'll use the rest of your life. Supplement means give your body, your life, everything it needs to grow. You need to go to a marriage conference because your marriage is struggling. Take your vacation, spend the money, and go. You need counseling. By, by the way, all counseling is, a lot of times, uh, Americans especially, we feel like, I don't need a counselor because only people who are, you know, on the rocks need counseling. That's ridiculous. Do you know what counseling really is? You go to a good biblical counselor. All it is is uh, focused discipleship. I mean, really? That's, that's what you're looking at. You're, you're having a person who's taking you from where you are, helping you get to a place that glorifies God, and they're walking you through the word how to get there. Counseling is nothing to be ashamed of. Spend the money and do it. It's a wise investment. Lavish on your spiritual walk everything you might possibly need to grow in Christ. Put your money there. You will not regret it. That's the idea of supplement our faith. And then he specifically gives our, ourselves some ideas. What does it look like? What do we need to add to our faith? He says, add to your faith, which, by the way, just lets us know that your faith by itself is insufficient to produce a disciple. We don't just stop when they say, I trust Jesus. We bring them to a place where they add to their faith something. What do we add? First thing he mentions is virtue. Well, that's obviously the integrity component, isn't it? He says, add to, your faith, or add to your faith virtue. Virtue is this idea of outstanding character. Okay? 
this outstanding character, I think of people in the Arthurian legend, I think of Knights of the Round Table. There are these laws and codes of chivalry that they had to follow. There was a code where they behaved and lived nobly. It wasn't enough that you knew how to cut a guy into pieces with a sword. You had to know how to treat a lady. You had to know how to protect the innocent. That's virtue. It's the skill, the art of living life nobly. Or as Paul would say, approve those things which are excellent. Don't just live at the status quo. Live an, an excellent life. He says, then add to, your, add to virtue knowledge. Obviously, you can't grow without knowledge, and this is very clearly the knowledge component of discipleship. Add to our faith knowledge. You can't grow without knowledge. We've already established that. Our, we, we grow through the renewing of our mind. And by the way, this knowledge component is so important and it's often misunderstood, we get to, oftentimes we'll, someone will approach us and they have a certain sin problem in their life and they don't know how to get over it because all we've tried to do is behavior modify them. Well, here, try this. Well, here, try this. But what, what do we need to get to? We've got to get to their knowledge. When a person sins, they're believing something that's false. Every action that we have in life is based upon a belief that we have. If you eat food, it's because you believe you need it to survive and you believe that it's safe, so you eat it. You go to work because you believe that you need it to earn money, which you do, and you believe that your boss is going to give it to you. You believe it. And even the false things that we do, every single sin that we commit is rooted in an error, in a lie. That's why Satan, in the first sin in the garden, he says, did God really say? And then what does Satan do? He convinces the woman that this sin that God said would be harmful for you, that it'll kill you. No, 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 no. This sin, God is withholding something good from you. Why did Eve sin? It's because she believed a lie that this sin God said is going to harm you. It's actually something good that God is withholding from me. And if I do it, it's going to bring something better in my life. I believed a lie. And so true life transformation has to involve this knowledge component of God of changing their fundamental beliefs that are producing these actions. So I don't just look at a guy and go, well, you know, why are you struggling with pornography? Well, maybe just stop struggling with pornography. Maybe just get it out of your life. But what have we not dealt with? Why is his heart longing for it to begin with? You see, at that point, only the word of God transforming his mind in what he believes to be true, and we can show him through the word of God how that actually is going to destroy your life now he no longer wants it because God has transformed his values through the word of God. And so knowledge is an important component. Add to your knowledge self-control. Okay, this is, a word, this is part of the integrity component. The word self-control means literally to hold yourself in, that there's certain desires of your flesh that are driving you towards certain things, but you're keeping it in check. You want to sleep in, but you don't. You get up anyway. You want to eat more, but you don't. You want to have dessert, but you don't. You're holding yourself in. Have you ever tried to take a dog on a walk who was not self-controlled? He had not learned meekness. He did not line up under his master. What's that little, what's that little brother doing? He's yanking on the leash, and you're like, come on back, Fido. You know, yanking him back. The dog is just always pulling off. He's not self-controlled. He's frustrating. Why is he yanking on the leash like that? Because he hasn't been trained to submit to the master. He doesn't want to be near the master. He wants to do what he wants to do. And he's trying to get there. And this leash, quite frankly, is in my way. And if I had a choice, I'd snap my mouth through it. <laughs> you know, and I'm going to run away from you if I could. That dog is, is not self-controlled. When you have a dog that is self-controlled, what does he do? He's right there by your side. And you walk along, and that leash almost doesn't need to be there. He'll just trot right next to you because his desires, he has submitted his desires with what the master desires, and he is content to walk wherever the master is going. He doesn't, he's withholding his desire to go into, you know, into the bushes and, you know, and chase that bird. You know, and the Bible says that we have to live a self-controlled life, that there's a certain measure of integrity that a Christian has to add to their life. It's not natural. What's natural is to follow the flesh. We got to be supernatural. We've got to withhold ourselves in our natural desires. We add to our faith, he says, steadfastness. Another word for this would be faithfulness. Steadfastness is the ability to continue to be committed to growing in the Lord when there's a lot of other things that are competing for that time and attention. Steadfastness. It means you remain doing good even if nobody else is. It means you keep pursuing the Lord even though it's not convenient for your life and you have to make room for it. 
means when Christian life is not easy, you keep going. It's faithful. It's the very attribute that we're looking for in a disciple in 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. And so we, we, drive, we, we drive to that place where our people are exercising steadfastness. Do you know what the biggest complaint I hear about D groups? And I've talked to a lot of you guys about your D groups. I don't know if you've known that or not. Uh, we've talked to a lot of you about a lot of things. We're trying to assess where are we at? What are we struggling with? Do you know one of the, one of the key complaints that we have about D groups right now is? One of the biggest struggles? Because I talk to people about their D groups and like, oh yes, we have eight people in our D group. I'm like, wow, or six people or however many. I'm like, why do you have so many? And they're like, oh, don't worry. Most of them never show up anyway. We only have ever about two or three or four of them show up. What are we lacking here? We're lacking steadfastness. Now, it may just be something very simple, that you have a bad time for that person. Maybe they should join a different group. If you can't meet on Monday nights very often, maybe you should be in a different group. It might just be something as simple as that. Or it might be that you just have a lot of other priorities in your life that are more important to you than your discipleship. We need to make sure that it's not the steadfastness component that's holding us back from being committed that it's just we'll find a better time. And we'll work on that, by the way. We, we're already, I'm working with the ladies of the office here. We're trying to come up with a, a, a component, a way where we can get people in the right group at the right place at the right time so you can be steadfast. So other things won't artificially limit your ability to remain faithful. Um, godliness. We're to add to our faith godliness. Now, godliness is a word that means piety. It has the idea of the outward external religious activities that we do. We add that to our faith. We make it a priority. You know, this would include things like going to church, going to Bible study, you know, those different things in the funnel that we talked about. It would be uh, the Lord's Supper. It would be baptism. It would be serving in the church. It's the outward external religious things that we do. We fast, we pray, we give. All of that has to be intentionally added to our life. Did you, you realize, like for your life, I don't know about, but for me, when I was born again, I didn't naturally do all those things. I didn't naturally give. I didn't naturally fast. I didn't naturally pray. I didn't naturally, I mean, I had a longing to be what God wanted me to be, but I had an ignorance about me. I didn't know what that looked like. And so we have to teach our people what godliness looks like and to remain steadfast in that. We supplement their faith for it. Um, then he says we add brotherly affection. This is a mutual sacrifice that we have for one another, that I have a, a love and a longing for other people such that I'm willing to be inconvenienced for them. We add that to our faith because, again, that's not natural to our flesh to give of myself for the benefit of somebody else. But you know, that's absolutely essential in discipleship. One of the problems we have in discipleship too is I'm not going to be involved in discipleship because I'm already a mature Christian. What's wrong with that statement? I mean, other than everything. Number one, are, are any of us ever truly beyond the need to keep growing? I mean, is there anybody here so mature that you don't need to keep growing? I mean, raise your hand that we might tithe to you. You know, because, I mean, you're obviously God because there's, we're, we all need to keep growing. And even, let's just say, by reason of argument, that you really are truly that mature and you need nothing that this church has to offer. Well, then you should be training up somebody else. But you see, that requires brotherly affection, that you are so concerned about the spiritual growth of your brother or sister that you're willing to take your own time to walk them through what God has shown you. But that has to be added to your life. It's a discipline. And then he says love. Love is that sum of all these attributes. It's what a disciple is. It's 1 John 4, 7, and 8. It's an evidence of your Christianity. Beloved, let us love one another. Why? Because love is of God. Everyone that loves knows God. And if you don't love, you know, you don't, you don't know God because God is love. We add that to our life. We go through these attributes of 1 Corinthians 13 and we measure it back to our life. Do I truly love somebody? I don't know. Let's see what the Word of God says. Let's add that to our life so that we are known by that. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you have love for one another. And so we've got to make sure that that, that is part of our, our discipleship. And if we do all this, he says... If these qualities, verse 8, are yours and increasing, they will keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in our knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Ineffective is a word that means unprofitable. It means that you're not willing to create profit 
for somebody else. Uh, have you ever worked with unprofitable people? I have. Uh, one of my first jobs when I entered into seminary was working at Firetronics, and I installed commercial fire alarms. And I discovered that these guys, uh, they would spend an hour playing uh, electrical tape bowling, and they'd line up these four square boxes, and they'd roll electrical tape <laughs> rolls at it, and they'd do that for a whole afternoon and not do a thing to profit their masters. Or they'd get done with a service call, and they would hang out, or they'd go to the mall, and they just they weren't willing to exert themselves for the profit of somebody else. And God says there's sometimes Christians can become uh, ineffective. They're not willing to exert themselves for God. I mean, nobody sets out to be a mediocre Christian, but sometimes we can just kind of fall into that category. We can fall into the category of being a one-talent servant. Do you know what I mean by that? Uh, if you read through the parable of Matthew 25, the parable of the talents, a talent is a measure, it's a weight of gold or silver. And this, this master gives out a certain amount of talents to different people, to one five, to one two, to one one. And he says, do business until I return. Take this money, I'm, you know, you're on my payroll, so I want you to take this money and I want you to exert your effort to bring me a profit. And he comes back and the guy who had five talents, what do he have? Five more. He says, well done, good, morally upright, and faithful. You did what I asked. Well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your Lord. He goes over to the guy with two talents, which, by the way, God doesn't give us talents equally, and that's okay. What he wants you to do is be faithful with what he's given you. And so the two-talent servant, he says, behold, I have two talents, and God gives him the same commendation. Well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your Lord. He goes to the guy with one talent. What had he done? He took the one talent and he buried it. He said, I knew you were a hard and austere man. You know, uh, you're just wanting to send this money with us so that I can make you a prophet. And what do I get out of this? So no, I put your talent into a hole and behold, here, have it back. What did God call him? He said, you lazy? No, what do you say? You wicked servant. You see, God sees spiritual laziness not as just a, a, a sad little thing that we do, but a silly little thing. Well, I guess I'm just lazy. God calls laziness wickedness. I am unwilling to exert myself for the master so as to profit him. I'm unwilling to use my time and my money and my resources for the Lord. None of us intend to be a one-talent servant, but sometimes we just allow life to dominate us, and we have nothing left to give to God. Part of discipleship is that we add these things to our life so that we don't become ineffective. He says also that we don't become unfruitful. It just means, unsurprisingly, that we don't bear fruit. You know, you plant uh, apple seed into the ground because you want to get apples someday. You don't so much care about the tree, maybe, but you want the apples. So you plant the seeds, you fertilize it, you keep the pests away, you build a fence around it, you watch this tree grow, you make sure the lawnmower doesn't run it over. And eventually this tree grows up and he's got all kinds of leaves but no apples. What do you think of that apple tree? You're kind of frustrated. You put a lot of work and money and effort into this apple tree and it's not giving you what you made it for. So what are you going to do? You're going to lay an ax to the root of that apple tree and you're going to make it into a bench. You're done. God, in the, in the same way, says that we are fruit. We're, we are fruit-bearing trees. John 15, that, you know, we're part of, we're a branch on his trunk and we're to bear fruit like we talked about this morning. We're to bear fruit. God created us to bear fruit. God finds joy in it when we bear fruit for him. And so we won't be unfruitful if we have added these things to our life. Add to your faith virtue and virtue knowledge and knowledge self-control and, and so on. If we're discipled people, what do we become? We're, I'll tell you what we're not. We're not unprofitable. We're not unfruitful. We're the kind of people that God finds joy in. And so that comes through the process of discipleship. You don't just become one of these fruitful Christians simply because you come to church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. That is not the measure of spirituality. Can I say that louder? You're not a spiritual person just because you faithfully attend services. It's what these services and these programs and these activities and your personal knowledge of God and your obedience to God, it's what it's supposed to produce in you. And that is a spiritual being. What is Unity Baptist Church here to produce? We're here to glorify God by making disciples that look and act like Jesus. How do we do that? By imparting knowledge and a system of accountability where there's obedience to that knowledge and we're helping one another along, encouraging one another 
that we might bear fruit in the shape of the fruit of the Spirit, that we become people who are known for their love, known for their joy, known for their peace, known for their patience, known for their gentleness, known for their self-control. We're, we're those kind of people. That is the end goal of what we're driving to, and it's the most important work in the world. I don't care if you're the CEO of a company. The most significant thing you will do in your life is invest your life into another human being to help make them more like Jesus Christ. I pray that you're willing to enter into that journey with us. So that's the end of this particular lesson. The next training session that we're going to have is, okay, so now we've got the big picture. What do we do with this? What does the actual day in, day out look like of being a facilitator? How do I actually accomplish these things? That's next Sunday night. The following Sunday night, we'll actually model it for you. But for tonight, let's just close in prayer. <clears throat> Our Father, we are grateful tonight that you have given us the opportunity to study your word, to be a part of the most significant task that a human can be, and that is to help guide people to the throne of grace, to receive Christ as Lord, and to truly live it out to make him as Lord to help people grow in their understanding and their knowledge of God, to see their minds transformed, their beliefs and their desires, their affections transformed so that they desire good things, so that they live out an obedient life, that they live a life of piety and godliness, that they are doing what good Christians do, but with the end goal of seeing their life transformed, that they look and act like Jesus and that they desire what he desires. Oh God, I pray that you would you would produce many disciples in this church like that who glorify you by acting like you. That this world might look in and see what we're doing in this church and see a group of loving people and by our love know that we are truly disciples of Christ. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Tonight, if you want to, uh, before you leave, if you want to come and have a look at the first module, we will have copies available for everybody who is here on the third night of the training so that as we're doing a sample session, you'll be able to follow along. Okay? But if you want to kind of get a sneak peek at these, uh, feel free. I'll have, a, I'll have a couple of these up front. We'll have some on the starting point desk and back. Feel free to thumb through it if you just kind of want to get an idea of what book one looks like. All right? Thank you, guys, and have a great night.